Hey there, my name's Parth. Now, I studied physics at university, and I did a lot of topics that involved studying very small things, such as quantum mechanics, condensed matter physics, atomic physics, and so on. But one thing I never studied was particle physics. So quite a while after graduating, I decided to rectify that. I gave myself one week to study as much particle physics as I could. More specifically, I gave myself 45 minutes per day. That's not because I think I can learn all of particle physics or even a reasonable amount of particle physics within a week doing just 45 minutes a day. However, this is a really good way for me to get into a routine of learning. And who knows when this video is over, I might still continue learning particle physics. I will be using this textbook, Introduction to Elementary Particles by Griffiths, not for any particular reason other than it had some decent reviews online. And as well as this, if there's something in the textbook that I don't understand, I will be using all of the internet that is available to me to try and understand that concept a little bit better. More than anything, I just really miss learning physics. I haven't had a chance to do that for a while, so what better excuse for a YouTuber than to make a video about it? I personally think I focus best in chunks of 20 minutes or so. So, you know those 45 minutes that I've given myself per day? Yeah, that's actually going to be a 20 minute chunk with a five minute break and then another 20 minute chunk. I'm actually only learning for 40 of those 45 minutes. There's a few different reasons for this. First of all, I find that if I have less time, then I'm going to stay a lot more focused and actually get stuff done rather than procrastinate. Because I now have such little time, I just have to learn and not mess around. But here's the thing. One of the biggest triggers for me to procrastinate or to step away from work is when I come across a concept that I don't understand or when I come across a mathematical step that doesn't quite make sense to me. Often what I'll start by doing is trying to understand that mathematical step by reading the previous line and then the next line over and over again. And when inevitably it doesn't make sense, I'll just think, ah, uh, maybe I need to let that sink in. Let's go and look at social media for a while. So I'm going to try and eliminate that, which is why I've given myself such little time. But also, if I come across something that doesn't really make a huge amount of sense to me, I'm not going to spend too much time pondering over it. I'm going to highlight it and maybe try and understand it within a couple of minutes or so. If it doesn't come to me, I'll leave that for when I'm not studying to think in the background. At the beginning of the week, I decided to read through the introductory chapter of the textbook. I could have skipped it and moved on to the real core information but I didn't want to feel like I was jumping into a story part way through. And I'm glad I read the introductory chapter, because it explained that although the book wasn't going to go into too many experimental details about particle physics, it would briefly discuss how the particles we are looking at can be generated and how they can be detected. In essence, particles are small building blocks of matter that we can indirectly detect using various methods depending on their exact properties. For example, we know the stuff that we commonly see around us every day is made up of atoms, which themselves are made up of protons, neutrons, and electrons. Although we can't see these particles, we have multiple ways of seeing the effects that they have on everything around them, and thus determining their exact properties from exactly what they do to the stuff around them. But how do we get these particles in the first place? Where do they come from? Well, it turns out we can get protons and electrons relatively easily. Electrons can be generated by heating up a metal loads and loads until we give the electrons within it enough energy to escape. This is the basis of cathode ray tubes used in old televisions, among other things. Televisions used to be called tubes, and hence we've now got U-tube. And protons can be generated by knocking out the electrons from hydrogen atoms. So we've talked a bit about protons and electrons already. But other more exotic particles, the pions and the kaons and the like, generating these is a bit more tricky because ordinary matter, the stuff we interact with on a day-to-day -day basis, is not made up of these exotic particles that are often short-lived. Instead, we rely on either cosmic rays, which are showers of protons from outer space, or nuclear reactors, or particle accelerators, such as the one at CERN. The last of these options is where we have the most control, because we can essentially smash particles together at higher and higher energies to break them apart into their smaller constituents. There's a lot more to this than what I'm letting on, of course, but that's the basic idea. Break big particles apart into smaller ones, then see how the smaller ones behave. 
But then we come to the question of how do we know these smaller particles are there at all? How do we detect them? Well, the whole principle of detecting these particles relies on the fact that those that have charge will end up interacting with the stuff around it. The charged particles will ionize stuff as they move through space. And this ionization can be seen as a trail left behind in a cloud chamber or a bubble chamber, for example. The way that the particle ionizes stuff around it, as well as the energies needed to make the particle, and how it interacts in a magnetic field, all allow us to work out the amount of charge and mass that the particle has. And neutral particles, which don't actually ionize stuff around them because they're neutral, can still be indirectly detected if they are to interact with other particles or split into particles that are charged. We often see regions where there are seemingly no particles and then we suddenly get a split off like this into a couple of different charged particles, for example. And the charged particles behave consistently with the particles generated from an uncharged particle that we'd expect to be here. Anyway, so this is what I learned over the first couple of days. In addition to this, I learned about a very cool concept called crossing symmetry. This concept allows us to understand one way in which particles moving forward in time are mathematically similar to their antiparticles, the particles that have everything the same except for opposite charge, are moving backwards in time. That's not to say that antiparticles do actually move backwards in time. It's just that they're mathematically the same as the particles moving forwards in time. I've made a whole video about this idea. Check it out up here or linked in the description box below if you're interested. I also learned a lot of interesting stuff about how particles were discovered over time, as well as how we fit them into groups that seem to organize them in a really neat way, whilst also predicting the existence of other particles that we hadn't discovered yet. This is incredibly reminiscent of Dmitry Mendeleev and his periodic table of elements, which organized all the known elements at the time into very neat groups and also predicted others that should exist but had not been discovered yet. And so with all this talk about the discovery of particles, crossing symmetry, organizing particles into multiplets and more, we finally got onto the real deal, Feynman diagrams. Now, Feynman diagrams deserve a video of their own and I will eventually make one for this channel. But just as a brief introduction, Feynman diagrams are these interesting looking diagrams that describe interactions between particles. For example, this diagram shows how two electrons were initially present and then they exchanged a photon between them. Doesn't matter which electron released it and which absorbed it, as the Feynman diagram shows both cases. And then there were once again two electrons. Now, this diagram is just a schematic, but it shows how particles interact over time. Time can be drawn as increasing to the right in this diagram. However, this diagram doesn't necessarily show what the particles were doing in space. So these two electrons moving apart from each other in the diagram doesn't necessarily mean they were moving away from each other in real space. This diagram is just showing how particle physics deals with electrostatic repulsion, or the fact that electrons repel each other because they're both negatively charged. In particle physics, the electromagnetic force happens due to the exchange of photons between charged particles, which is interesting and deserves a proper discussion. But the point with Feynman diagrams is that they are created with some mathematically complex rules based on the theories developed in particle physics. And ultimately, these simplify down to some very nice visual rules that focus on the vertices in these diagrams, as well as creating some very pretty pictures for us to look at. Anyway, with all that being said, I'm going to make a proper video about Feynman diagrams, so keep an eye out for that. I hope you enjoyed somewhat this look into how I learned some new physics. Restricting the amount of time I gave myself ensured that I spent the time I did have actually working and learning. And in addition to this, I didn't put any pressure on myself to do all of the problems in the book or to do well in an exam. So I actually enjoyed the process of learning something new, something that I've been missing for a little while now. 
Overall, this process has been pretty fun, so I think I'll continue learning particle physics, and hopefully we get some new juicy video ideas along the way. Thanks for watching! If you enjoyed this video, then please hit the thumbs up button and subscribe, and hit that bell button for more fun physics content. Check out my merch linked in the description below. It features a quantum dice design based on a famous quote from Albert Einstein. And finally, a huge thanks to all of my Giga patrons, as well as all of the others over on my Patreon page. That's linked down below as well if you'd like to support me on there. Thank you so much for watching once again, and I will see you very soon.